heaven forbid the employers that have people driving 18 wheelers we just legalized one more vice to make it more dangerous to be on the roads wait what Private. he just made the connection that hemp is going to cause 18 wheelers to, to crash drive into off people. the road yep exactly right hi everybody lucas here with hometown hero i'm here with cynthia cabrera and we're going through our senate committee hearing notes from the other day uh, they had some very interesting experts uh, that came and gave them some information, and we wanted to go through and spend some time on sort of analyzing what was said and the responses. So we're going to go ahead and start and dive into it with us and hope you enjoy it as much as we do. And this is super interesting and super fascinating, so let's do it. Hit play. Yes, ma'am. I have worked in the emergency department for 34 years, and there, unfortunately, we do not split up Delta 8 and Delta 9 to us. It's all THC. It's all THC. How can it be all THC if one is federally illegal, another one is federally legal, and how do you address it if you don't know where it came from? I mean, doesn't that seem like a strange so, way? This was a common theme among all of the testimony about the people that were sort of, if you want to call it anti-hemp, or people that are not a fan of the hemp, the, the hemp program, the way it's set up. And we're essentially trying to move everything into teacup, which is the Texas Compassionate Use Program, for those of you who don't know. So Texas has a medical program. They also have a hemp program. There's both within Texas. So the problem is THC is in teacup. THC is also in hemp. So there's a lot of overlap here. And you'll see some of the experts just take marijuana data, throw it on hemp, or take something beneficial from hemp and say it's from marijuana. They're, it's, it's, it's like they're being treated like two completely separate plants when it's literally the same plant. But wait, back it up. There's more. Because, yeah, he tees it up to say, he tees it up to say it's all THC. So he's telling you at the outset, I don't know what comes from hemp. I don't know what comes from marijuana from the Compassionate Use Program. I don't know. It's all THC. Well, and, and as we go into it, that's, that's the problem with a lot of this medical data is, was it a street drug? Right? Yeah. Is this is this a drug that somebody bought off the street and ended up having something in it? We don't know. Is did this come from the marijuana program? We don't know. Did it come from him? We don't know. And so all of this data being cited it, it largely doesn't have a lot of relevancy because you don't even know what the context of it is. So I talked to my cousin over the weekend who is uh, an emergency room nurse in LA, and I was telling her about the hearing and the doctor and all that stuff, and calls to poison control, and she said, "You know what?" She said, in LA, she said, we will get people in the ER who are definitely strung out on something, and the only thing they'll cop to is THC because it's legal in the state. She said, but they can be on meth, they can be on heroin, they can be on cocaine, and they will not say it. She said, and we end up having to make the call to poison control because yeah. we have to report it. She says, and all we say is they were on THC. I can tell you that when the ER patient's presenting due to a THC ingestion, can be broadly broken down into three categories. One, pediatric patients who have accidentally overdosed on a grown-up's THC. Pediatric patients, this is minors, correct. Correct. correct, that are somehow accessing products their parents bought. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, that would be the only way they would be able to get them. Yeah, so, okay, point made. Product. Two, patients who present an acute psychosis due to THC. And three, chronic... THC does not cause psychosis. This is a fact. Years, Texas has seen an increase in THC-related poison center calls, many of which have been children after an accidental ingestion of THC. This has led to children being sent to the emergency department where I see them and a number of them being admitted to the hospital and even if some being admitted to the ICU for advanced. But he's not going to tell us which of those children was because they got straight up marijuana or which were hemp, right? Well, there's, also, he can't. there's also no numbers. Right. Bring up these concerns not to diminish programs such as the Compassionate Use Program, which is based on research and is done in a controlled environment at the direction of a trained physician. To protect... Is there research or is there not research? That's the thing is he goes back and forth. Depending on, depending on what his argument is, he goes back and forth about there so being research or not research. All THC is THC. But there's no research, but when it comes to the compassionate use, there's research. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I'm up to speed. To protect Texans, we recommend the following. Give the Department of State Health Services jurisdiction over all consumable hemp products to assess product safety and to close exploited loopholes. 
So he wants to take an entire multi-billion dollar industry that hasn't had a single death. Um, as far as I can tell, there's nobody even that's even been in the hospital that they can prove came from hemp. And basically wipe out an entire industry, not make it illegal, but hand it over to DECO. Correct. Because that's a much better way of doing this than the free market way. Also, close exploited loopholes. Okay. I'm so sick of the word loophole. You I, and I, both. <laughs> you and I, both. I am so sick of it. If you write a law and you say, this is covered, and this is covered, and this is covered, is everything else that's not in there a loophole? No, you covered the thing that you want to you wanted to cover an ambiguity or inadequacy, inadequacy in the law or a set of rules. So let's be clear: the Farm Bill spelled out very, very clearly what hemp is. It's not at is, all ambiguous. What is legal from hemp? Isomers, salts, acids. It's got everything in there. Yep. That that definition of hemp in the Farm Bill is as crystal clear as you can get. And we've spoken with chemists about this. The chemists say. There is no ambiguity to this no ambiguity. whatsoever. There's only ambiguity if you want there to be. Correct. Um, so anybody that calls what is an essentially in the farm bill and subsequently got passed down to a lot of the states as they adopted rules, um, it is not a loophole. It was written very, very specifically. So I don't understand the loophole language. It's, it's almost like kind of throwing shade on it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like people like to say that, especially politicians or people that don't like the hemp industry. Um, it's really easy to say, oh, that's a loophole, but legally it is not. It's not a loophole. It's not. Because the law, and if you look at the regulations under dishes, there's very specific rules and regulations. So Correct. all of those are being followed. There is no loophole. That's just an easy out for something you don't like. Yeah, it's, it's basically just, it's resorting to essentially name calling because yes. you don't have an argument that's going to yes. fit. Ensure that all THC products are appropriately labeled with the total THC concentrations, not only nine, delta nine, and that other active ingredients be listed also. And that we should continue to invest in a robust product. Well, on this we agree. We list all our ingredients. We think other people should list all their ingredients. I, I don't know who's not doing it. We're but... all for responsible packaging, yeah. responsible Labeling. clarity, transparency, yep. all that stuff. Like, Definitely. That is 100% should be a part of what we're doing as an industry, and we have no problem with that whatsoever. And a robust product laboratory testing system with funding to ensure state and federal compliance and the ability to detect contamination of any harmful chemicals. Where, does all, where do all the fees in the state go? We don't know. Didn't you ask? Or have we asked? Have we done a FOIA? Uh, no, we've asked kind of like informally and nobody's been able to tell us. Exactly I mean, it just, it goes into the pit. There's, that's the thing with Texas, at least from what I can tell is with the hemp fees, I mean, so um, Dr. Stevenson, who goes on before Dr. Emick, actually talks about having the certain number of employees and, and by increasing the budget, they're now hiring like six more people. Mm -hmm. So they are actively hiring people, but if you do 7,000 registered companies times $250 a year. How much is that? Let's do the math. I know there's a bunch of zeros in there. So it's 250 times, let's call it 7,000 because there's 7,000 registered companies. That's 1.75 million. That's not nothing. And they have two and a half employees right now. Okie dokie. So that, that is a valid question. Where is all this money for the hemp program going? Inquiring minds want to know. Dad, what we mainly see in, most frequently in the emergency department is the uh, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. Initially, when we would see them, they would have their severe abdominal pain and nausea vomiting. They would require admission for uh, IV antiemetics to help with their nausea vomiting and to help, they would require narcotics for their abdominal pain. We... Somebody comes in consistently asking for narcotics and experiencing withdrawal symptoms. I feel like that should be a red flag. Um, that's essentially what he is citing and what he's using as his own personal sort of testimony. Um, it's not a case study. It's It's literally two people that I don't these even are know anecdotes if, he's sharing well they are and I don't even know if he actually had direct experience with either of these two people or if he's repeating a story from somebody else but I will say I, I have looked up what he's talking about it is a real thing it does exist but 
as he's describing this, this sounds to me like two people that are addicted to opioids and they're coming back to get more. That's what this sounds like to me. And it, now that you say that, it does sound like Well, that. a lot of the testimony that came from people, unfortunately, sounded like there was other underlying issues. And, and I got more information talking to my cousin on the phone on Saturday than I'm getting right now because she pointed out that all these people, because they are, she lives in California, she's in LA, and because marijuana is legal in California, they feel very comfortable saying, oh, I took THC. But they don't feel comfortable mentioning if they cop prescription drugs from somebody else or they, you know, had some meth or whatever. Well, in a state like Texas, too, where, you know, technically marijuana is still illegal, like, you don't want to go Not to the Not technically. Hospital. It is still illegal. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a medical marijuana program. What I'm saying oh, is yeah. there, there's street marijuana still available right. in Texas, yeah. right? So, yeah. so not all marijuana and hemp in Texas is legal. There's still street drugs available here that you can buy. Yes. Right? Illegal street drugs. And th so, so where is the distinction between any of this stuff? Well, he said it's all THC. There is no distinction. But that's, that's the problem. Yes, I agree. This, this hearing is not about everything being the same. No. This hearing is, is being about, about there being clear differences between the two. But the reality is... So he says, the, the message, and tell me if you think I'm wrong, the message that he's sending is that, hey, teacup is okay because there's studies behind it, but hemp is not okay because we don't know anything. But at the beginning, he says it's all Correct. THC Correct. and there's no studies. Correct. So he's talking both ways and it doesn't, it doesn't add anything. He's not giving us any, real, any data that says, oh, there were this number, you know, these are the brands that were involved look, in this I've, thing or whatever. I've, I've looked him up. He's a smart doctor. He's highly qualified. He's got a ton of experience. Um, I, I'm kind of in shock that he didn't have any medical studies when sort of pressed about, you know, whether, whether on the positive side or on the negative side, he really didn't have a lot to cite in terms of studies. And I feel like there's an overwhelming amount of evidence on the study side, and that's probably why he shied away from it, almost done on purpose. I mean, listen, there's a lot of doctors, there are a lot of medical professionals who believe in the cannabis plant, and they see that there's a lot of potential there, but they're really not going to say that. Certainly not somebody who's a state witness, right, is not going to say something like that. I mean, you're here for a specific agenda. You need to make sure that you do your job with that agenda. Oh, here we go. 221.9 million results for medical marijuana studies. <laughs> so there was some information out there. A um, little bit. A little bit. I feel like being on an expert panel, I would have... I would have... Done a Google search? Done a little bit of more of a detailed search on that, but it is what it is. They refused to think that it was the... THC or the cannabinoid that was uh, causing this. Might be because it wasn't. Or it would have been good to know what they reported, what quantities they had consumed. Or what did they think it was? If it's not THC, then what is it? The internet and through studies, we have found that there was another symptom that they got relief of their symptoms with a hot tub. So there's no studies as he says at the outset, but now they reference studies about how to deal with it. <laughs> After five or six years, both of these gentlemen realized the issue and they both quit their, uh, the THC consumption on a daily basis. He stopped himself from saying marijuana and he said it was in another state where marijuana was legal. He stopped himself from saying marijuana and switched to THC. Just pointing it out. Syndrome. That is that they come in six times a year, and then that's for about four or five years, and then they tend to uh, recognize an issue, have help, and then don't have the symptoms anymore. So he's talking about this like this is a common occurrence, and, and my take from the research that I did on it was this is not common. This is very right. uncommon. Right. And he's talking about it like this happens just daily yeah, all right. across America. Yeah. Like there's all these people in these hot tubs from smoking too much weed, which sounds great. Um, but I, I, I think he's drastically overplaying the prevalence of this and sort of the frequency of it. The um, court case that's pending, 
I, I'm going to make a statement if this is the reason that you're, you're kind of at a stalemate. It's because Delta 8 was not specifically addressed in the statute, and it kind of came about through some cute chemist in the industry. So, uh, Senator Perry, um, I have a lot of respect for him, like I do all of our Texas politicians, but uh, he, he consistently has it out for us. Uh, he's referenced us as being cartel or cartel-related multiple times, uh, even in this, in this hearing. So what he's talking about, he's essentially saying that uh, the only reason Delta 8 is legal is because it wasn't properly called out. He's saying the opposite. He's saying Delta 8 is illegal because it's not included in the USDA definition on which Texas based its definition of hemp. But if that's the case, then it would be illegal and we wouldn't be able to sell it. He thinks it's illegal. That's what he's saying, but that it's illegal. I know, but what I'm saying is there's no validity to that. Otherwise, oh, no, no, it no. actually would be illegal. Correct. And, and this is what happened with the DSHS website and the subsequent lawsuit is they put a note on the website saying that Delta 8 was illegal and had always been illegal. If and Delta so we had to sue over it. Right. So if Delta 8 was illegal. But this, illegal, that was never done legislatively. Doesn't matter if, I mean, I appreciate that, but it doesn't matter because if we had filed, uh, we had requested an injunction, right? We filed for this emergency mm -hmm. injunction and it was pretend that Texas came out and said, cocaine is illegal and they put a notice on their website, and then we sued them. Do you think we would be awarded an injunction? No. Right. So the case, the judge understood that Correct. the Farm Bill definition does not make Delta-8 or other cannabinoids illegal. All it does is set the threshold at 0.3% Delta-9. That is it. They started researching Delta-8 in, like, the 1940s. Yeah, it's, it's been around a long, long time. Contrary to what... A lot of people want us to believe around the hemp industry and what, what's being said by big marijuana. I'm just going to call it big marijuana. Oh. It is what it is. Um, I love the marijuana industry. I love the small operators. The large companies that are publicly traded are scum of the earth. These are not the people that were pro-cannabis, pro-marijuana that we grew up with. These are business people that are out to make a buck and they don't care who they run over in the process. Yep. And they are in the process of trying to destroy a multi-billion dollar industry throughout the country and essentially appropriate it into the hands of their large MSOs. Yeah. Um, so for those of you in the marijuana industry, I love you guys, I think you're great. If you're one of large MSOs, not so much. Um, so just <laughs> wanted to make that, make that clear with everybody. I, I have a lot of friends in the marijuana industry, I love them to death, um, and I think they're great people and I think it's a great industry. I think there's a lot of issues with it that hemp has resolved and sort of you know turned in kind of the 2.0 and better version of, um, but the lar the small marijuana operators, I, I love them to death. I want to see them succeed and we'll do whatever it takes, you know, to, to help them out in states where, where that's the thing. Um, but in Texas, it's one marijuana company versus an entire hemp industry. And, you know, the language that we use around a state back state sanctioned monopoly is 100% correct. That's what it is. There's one license holder. I mean, I understand Senator Perry if he if he believes and it seems like the dishes guy supports it that because Delta 8 was not included in the USDA definition, rather it was this overly broad, super expansive definition that obviously is meant to encourage innovation and experimentation and it, it, it includes all cannabinoids and derivatives, you know, derivatives that, um, of the plant. So if it's a fundamental, just basic, like, oh, hey, my bad, kind of misunderstanding of what the law says, then I understand, I can understand why Senator Perry is like so put out about this whole thing because he's like, no, this is illegal. It says it in the thing, but the dishes, people that he seems to be taking um, the advice from are also not understanding what the federal farm bill language says. Correct. So, well, I think everybody understands what it says. I think they're choosing to interpret it in their own way. Possibly. Listen, it's, all, it's pretty clear. Well, I don't want to ascribe motivations to anybody. I can just speak to what they do or say. And I, I get, I, I have problems with the word loophole too, because it's, Look, this country is great, and this country tends to be very- That's our new t-shirt, I'm not a loophole. Well, this country tends to, to be innovators and drivers and sort of top tier of whatever we do. So 
why would we not set, why would our government not set the hemp industry up to be a forefront, a leader within the world? And how do you best do that? You open it up to research, you open it up to business, you open it up to commerce, and that's what happened with the 2018 Farm Bill. So I don't, I, I'm confused as to people why they think it's a loophole or it was accidental when it's, it, for me, it's an obvious play of let's be, for, let's be at the forefront, let's be leaders within the world in this category. Well. And, and that's what's happening. But there's two parts to that. The largest hemp industry in the world now is in America. The, there's two parts to that. When you hear people talk about the federal loophole, alleged loophole, they say, well, Congress never intended. That's one part of it. But before Congress could agree to it or not agree to it, it had to come out of the USDA. And the USDA employs scientists and doctors and right. lawyers and right. consultants and all kinds of people. They knew exactly what they were doing. Right. They knew exactly what they were doing. It's incumbent on every legislator to make sure that they understand what they're voting for or voting against or whatever. But you can't say that the USDA didn't know what they were doing. It was up to Congress to accept it or not accept it. Correct. And subsequently, the state of Texas. Correct. Yeah. So. That, that decided they could be smarter than what we were trying to do. And obviously they were. They had their way for a while. But is that is that the reason we're stuck is... The statute did not address Delta. You know what I don't like about this? And I, again, I'm, I, I understand he's got a difficult job and he's trying to do what he thinks is best. It really ascribes kind of nefarious intentions to an industry that has just like busted its Correct. butt to get to right. where we are. I mean, a lot of people have sacrificed a lot to get where we are. And so this is kind of like, oh, we're all nefarious players here. And that kind of... And, and just to give context and backstory on this, and everybody may not know because this was so long ago, Senator Perry was one of the main proponents of House Bill 1325, which legalized hemp in Texas. And uh, he came at it from the premise of, and, and in his defense, he came at it from the premise of textiles and fabrics and sound deadening and all these, all these things that you can produce with hemp. Uh, and his argument is he wasn't aware that there was psychoactives that could come from hemp and essentially the industry could turn into what it's turned into now. Uh, and you so, mean a big booming industry? A, a magical thriving industry. <laughs> one of the largest, fastest growing industries Well, nobody in the saw that coming, so. So, and, and yeah, and in his defense, you know, I, he's right. And so, but the thing is, this industry has evolved just like anything else, just like, you know, any other new burgeoning industry it's going to evolve, it's gonna take on a life of its own. And so this industry has evolved and it's now massive and it's, it's this big, beautiful industry. Um, but taking the mindset of let's do a full ban, full wipeout, hands arguably what's a you know, five to $10 billion industry in Texas and just hand it over to a single license holder, it doesn't make sense. That is known as a monopoly. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I was the only license holder in Texas for the medical program, I would be doing everything I could to stop me if I wasn't. The I mean, if we're going to hand over the whole industry to them, like, give me some equity in that. If I wasn't Let's the, do that. Well, I have a capitalist mindset. But if I wasn't that person, I would be like, yeah, let me stomp out the one thing keeping me from being the only player in the state on any level. Dude, I, I was the author of the hemp because of the farm bill. Um, it was meant to give agriculture a new product for the market, specifically in the fiber market. And as predicted, when I passed that, I said, if you got... Well, if he predicted it, then why did he do it? I don't know. And also, he says, we created a mess, a.k.a., you know, tens of thousands of jobs, millions of dollars in revenue. It's one of the Add best things the... that could happen. And it, while we're dealing with economic issues... Hello. It, uh, screw this up by being cute and getting people high from it, there will be consequences. And we've tried for several sessions to come up with the magic formula. That is true. I would argue, or I would state, Mr. Chairman, don't chase the chemistry. Well, I would say, I mean, we did introduce an age gate bill last year, which got zero traction. I from brought anybody. it up. I brought I it up in there. He didn't like that. It's probably simpler than that. And maybe CUP program comes to mind. Yep. Again, he's referencing basically turning the entire hemp program over into teacup, which is the Texas Compassionate Use Program. So if you hear anybody say teacup or cup, that's essentially what they're referencing. It's not a program. It's a single company. It was foretold this could happen, and now we've got people getting high 
off of something in Texas that we have said we don't do, and it's by virtue of... So that. it's unfair to characterize everybody who uses the product as somebody who wants to get high. True story, at the gym the other day, a woman in her early 60s came over and she's like, hey, I heard that you work for this company, blah, blah, blah. She said, I have chronic pain. She says, I have this broken thing in her neck. She's supposed to have surgery. She said, I'm on this gabapentin thing. I'm on this other thing. She's like, can you help me? Yep. So I brought her some gummies. And she said she slept pain-free for the first time in months. Yep. So it is unfair to characterize everyone who uses these products as somebody who's you know, chasing a high. Yeah. Because you can get high without hemp products. So you, <laughs> you don't need one for the other one. Agreed. It's by virtue of very cute industry making a lot of money at people's expense. So um, I hope we fix this. It's at people's expense implies that more people have been hurt than people have been helped. And I would say, even based on the hearing from Wednesday, more people spoke about how it had helped them than the people who spoke about how they had been harmed. It's not even close. And I will also say about the people who had been harmed, which is a terrible thing, and we hate to hear it, and it's not great. If I understood correctly, all of those folks who were dealing with an issue related to THC were all adults. And it was also all marijuana. And it was all marijuana. I think Colorado was the common denominator. I want to back up real quick, and you may not know this, uh, Stevens. I'm told that a lot of the, the cannabis-friendly states, those that have legalized pot outside of the federal guidelines of illegal, are actually trying to get rid of Delta-8 now. Is that something you're aware of or something you know? Is that is that something you can... On states where there are medical or recreational marijuana programs, the MSOs are coming in and trying to get rid of us. Not trying. They're doing a terrific job. The MSOs have... Ca I mean, listen, in fairness, the the marijuana industry, you know, the activists and the yeah. those folks from, you know, 50, 60 years ago, they're not around anymore, but they were just pushing for access to the plant. All these people that, you know, leverage state legislatures, they've been doing it for such a long time. I mean, the hemp industry has been advocating for what, three years? The marijuana industry has been advocating for 60 years. So they've got a leg up on us. They've got a lot of established relationships the hemp industry doesn't have. And they've got a really good narrative where they're like, hey, those things are a loophole. You don't need that if you have us. I mean, it's all this and none of all of it is protectionist. All of it is regulatory capture. All of it is prohibitionist. It's yeah, it's just in search of another monopoly. Lots of money running through these 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 establishments. Have you seen an element of some of the cartel uh, in some of these suspected yeah. problems or problems? Are they beginning to move some of their laundry or some of their money through that? Have you got any indication the that they're involved in? the trade. He keeps looking well, for the so car. If I was going to compare... Uh... What's interesting about this is that the hemp industry is federally legal, legal according to the state, and somehow he's trying to tie it back to illegal cartels, which is who will take over the industry Correct. if he eliminates the legal industry. Correct. The irony is like, it's a good thing I already had lunch because I, I would be sick right now with the irony substance that has become illegal, that would be uh, the K2 or the bath salts. And the re reason that I would compare those two is because ultimately what happened with the K2 was that the, the uh, criminal organizations did get involved. There was some actual... So again, they're going down the path of K2 and Spice were completely synthetic, made up drugs, um, not analogs to marijuana or cannabis or hemp. And so he's trying to make a pretty far grasp of saying these industries had criminal activities and he, they even bring up terrorism, trying to tie it to the hemp industry. So now we've got cartels tied to the hemp industry. We've got terrorist groups tied to the hemp industry. These are just claims that are being made from yeah. ancillary, like outside completely separate things. And they're trying to, is that a possibility that could happen well, with Well, wait hemp? a minute. When you throw all that stuff out there, it's on, now it's on the industry to have to prove their innocence despite not having done anything. Yeah, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're just making stuff up. They're just taking stuff from other industries and, and just trying to tie it. it. Is this a possibility this could happen with hemp? Oh, we need to ban it. it, it this hemp equals terrorism, gotta ban it. It doesn't make any sense. Um, terrorism related 
uh, organizations that were involved. But Involved with K2 and Spice? Yes. That had nothing to do with hemp. Seen that necessarily with the uh, hemp and Delta 8 products. I'm not saying that it's not going on, but because of the nature of the way that the laws are written right now. If terrorism was involved with hemp and marijuana and cannabis, 100% we would know about it because there's government agencies that their only job is to track that and do that. So I don't even understand how we're having a conversation about terrorism being involved with hemp. Uh, injunction, we're just not able to uh, enforce and in investigate those in relation to the Delta and the hemp. Not true. What his, he's saying that the injunction doesn't allow them to investigate. They're allowed to investigate all they want. What they can't do is arrest people for possessing or selling Delta 8 products. That's all they can't do. They can investigate whoever they want. Yeah, they've arrested people for THCA in Texas. Yeah, so that's not quite accurate. But, but I would also suggest don't chase the chemist because you'll never catch them. As we go through this conversation, let's be a Keep little saying smarter. That. Keep saying, don't chase the chemist. On how to shut down the problem that unintentional consequences. What's the problem? What is the problem? I mean, there were some adult users of marijuana in Colorado who then transferred over to Texas and continued to have a problem. The dishes guy didn't say there's a public health emergency. No. He didn't say people are dropping like flies. So what's the problem? That the program or the, the, the legislation allowed the industry to thrive and innovate and become something that no one foresaw, that no one knew was coming? That's the problem? Yeah. We gotta be able to roll with stuff. Although probably foreseen, if I'm honest, and said, if you go back and review testimony, I said it very clearly, we will shut it down if it goes beyond where it needs to be. And it was once said, here's the sad fact. I said that if this gets loose, you will kill the agricultural industry conversation. And truthfully- uh, okay. so, so he just said, if this gets loose, it will kill the agricultural industry. Yes. My issue with that is that the idea of hemp houses and hemp sidewalks and hemp crete and hemp whatever. Do you remember that guy that we heard do the presentation on the hemp houses and we were all just crying at the end? Because it was so depressing. <laughs> but this requires you to believe that if our products were not being made with the hemp being grown, then there would be an entirely different industry. There, is, there was an oversupply of hemp. That's why the CBD market crashed. Where was all the innovation to come in after the 2018 Farm Bill? Where were all the people who were like, oh my gosh, we have people waiting for all this oversupply of hemp? What he's saying is that the agricultural side hasn't been allowed to flourish. Number one, the agricultural side right now is surviving because they sell the processors that sell to us. Right. And there is nothing impeding the progress or innovation on the ag side or the building side or the clothing side. There's nothing in the way of that. Other than actually supporting the farmers who want to do that stuff and giving them an ability to make money on a crop that they otherwise probably wouldn't be making money on. I would say that we, on our side, on the finished goods side, we support farmers more than anybody. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. The hemp fiber production in this state and around the country, for that matter, has been um, undermined. Okay, again, I have to go back to this. It hasn't been undermined. It is a colossal lift. So to remind you, the guy who gave the presentation on the hemp houses was talking about how difficult it was to get insurance for hemp houses, how contractors didn't want to work on hemp houses because it just wasn't established enough. They had not been rated yet by the certifying agencies, by ASTM or NIST or whoever it was that has to certify materials that get used in construction and nobody's going to use materials in construction that haven't been certified. This is, this is not a complete explanation. This is brushing over it and again, you know, it's impossible for a legislator to know everything about everything, right? That statement is not accurate. I agree with that. I mean, is there some more further upstream distribution that you could be testing products to make sure they're safe? Other states have seals that, that things have been tested, that it's, it's safe. I don't see anything of that kind in Texas. This overlooks the fact that the state already requires full panel testing, right? So. 
it over the the idea that marijuana is you know somehow safer, healthier, something more tested. We do five panel testing. Mm -hmm. I mean, what? How much more? What tests are we missing? So this no overlooks. Yeah, this overlooks that. This whole conversation about this Delta Eight, Delta Nine. Some people see it as an alternative. You said earlier that that now people are getting high. I, I'm not trying to be argumentative. People have been getting high in this state for a long time. <laughs> and, and the reality is, do we... Some people feel that going to a vape shop and buying something, they're buying something that's safe. And the reality is that it's probably safer for them to use a product that's not currently legal in this state. And, and we need to have a long conversation. Love this guy. Have to disagree with that statement. He's saying it's probably pro products that aren't regulated are probably safer. Isn't that what he said? Illegal products. Illegal products are probably safer than our products. But that doesn't speak to the fact that the state requires testing. So if you're a compliant company in the state, you have to test your product. Yeah. And the COA is supposed to be available. So I, I think like... I love this guy. So we just need to like talk to the right folks and remind them about what's in the regulations. Yeah. It, one of the best products for nerve pain, better than gabapentin, better than any narcotic, is cannabis. Are you familiar with that? There are people that would say that. I have not seen the research that confirms it. Do you think there's a study in the 2.9 million results that Google returned? about cannabis and pain relief, uh -huh. I'm willing to bet there's a couple. <laughs> I mean, the dogs can't tell the difference between cannabis and, and the hemp products, and so therefore it's almost impossible to prosecute. Is that an accurate statement? Yes, sir. So, so in, a, in a way, inadvertently, we passed a law that sort of legalized the use of cannabis. And inadvertently, they've helped millions of people that use the products. Kudos to the Texas legislature. Sure. The other states that you speak to, a large part of them, or some of them, are now reconsidering and pulling back. Oregon specifically has decided that maybe the path to legalized pot was not the smart thing to do. If you talk to people in Colorado, they tell you it was a, 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 a mistake. So I haven't seen one legislature move to roll back marijuana legalization in a rec state. Well, Colorado post profitability because of it. Colorado is also, I think they just like legalized psilocybin or something. Yeah, I haven't seen one state moving to undo what they did with marijuana. Yep. So clear, Texas did not legalize pot knowingly or unknowingly in the sense that the direction this started out was a federal farm bill for the benefit of agriculture. And it's been, it's negative. The federal farm bill definition was expansive and overly broad so as to spur innovation, not just in agriculture. Yeah, I, I, I feel like that's either dishonest or naive to assume that it was just agricultural. Now, we may have a federal administration now currently that decides to throw everybody out with the bathwater and then and, and heaven forbid the employers that have people driving 18-wheelers, we just legalized one more vice to make it more dangerous to be on the roads. Wait, what? Private companies can decide what their company policies are. He just made the connection that hemp is gonna cause 18-wheelers to, to crash To drive off people. the road, yep, exactly right. But this was a conversation we had in 19. It's sad that, unfortunately, human nature being what it is, we've got here today. But back Human nature being what it is, people are essentially bad, people are essentially nefarious, people are essentially going to do the worst thing possible versus people creating an industry that employs tens of thousands of people and allows other people to buy helps homes, millions helps millions of veterans. I mean, that, that the, these are the options. Would you mind just kind no, of highlighting yeah. your specific recommendations? Yeah, yes, ma'am. First would be childproof containers. Mm -hmm. Second would be... Uh, Child resistant containers. Uh, the no marketing to children, appropriate marketing to adults only. And then thirdly, but most importantly, is we would record 20, 21 year age limit if you were to allow for recreational use. 
all those things are reasonable. Child resistant packaging, not child proof. Um, don't market to kids. Nobody's marketing to kids as it is now. And then uh, what was the last one? Age gate. Age gate. We, which we've been pushing for for the last two sessions. You know what is happening I'm out to get there? Trying to get age gate done now multiple times. I will find. Oh gosh, I don't know where they are. But first of all, all these marijuana products that everybody thinks is so great, they look. They somehow the marijuana in the marijuana legal states, they're not subjected to the oh marketing to kids. Anything goes. You can have a Popeye thing or some whatever on the package and it's cool. It's not a problem. It's only us that is marketing to kids. Well, allegedly. When you have products that are only available in stores where you gotta be 21 and up and old to enter. I mean, at that point, is it really marketing to kids regardless of what you put on it? I mean, there's not, nobody's putting like Mickey Mouse on these packages or anything like that. I mean, it might have some colors, it might have, it might have a, a character, it might have whatever. But if you can't even get access to the products as a child, how are you marketing to children? Uh, what, that's an excellent question. Also, what we have, what they haven't recognized yet, is that we have a lot of lazy people or some lazy people in this industry. So they find a package of something they like and then they just rip it off. Yeah. There's no nefarious intention there. Oh, I'm going to target minors who have no money. I'm going to target them. No, they're just lazy and they're trying to, they're trying to pick something which has mass market appeal. Right? Well, because, we've had companies rip us off too. Sure. But it, it's laziness. Yeah. It's not this nefarious thing that they're going after, you know, minors that don't have a dollar. Yeah. Yeah. 2,500 cases uh, approximately in zero to five, 891 cases, six to 12 year olds, and 2,100 approximately 13 to 19 year olds. And so, how much of these were teacup products and how much were hemp products? How much were illegal? The thing is, you don't know what they are. They're That's just, what I'm saying. How much is how much is from the teacup program, and how much is from hemp? How much is illegal? And how much is illegal? Okay. Okay. So we do need to research a product that's in wide distribution for its legitimacy in the way of benefits or not, and then if it is beneficial, work it to a form of where we can control quality as well as impact for those people that's cheap to do it. We don't. In your humble opinion, as a medical professional, you don't have that data today. I do not. Okay, very, and that's a great answer. I just, I just assumed it. THC is THC, so that's that's a layman's perspective. But that's literally what the doctor said in the beginning. Yep. That is all THC, and then now he's saying it's not. Like, yeah. I appreciate the honesty, and we we may need to move on research and pull it out of the market until we get there. Because that's what we do with products all the time. I mean, I don't. Out of the market. We don't know enough about olive oil. Let's pull it off the market. Nobody needs it. How come sugar's still on the market? Yeah, show me a good study. Show me a study that shows that <laughs> alcohol is beneficial to anybody in any way whatsoever in any kind of capacity. Ever. Show, show me a study that says sugar is good for you. True. True. Or They're both um, and the thing is, is that. Psychoactive, I mean, caffeine is psychoactive. It changes the way you feel, right? Caffeine is psychoactive. Nobody's pulling that off the market. Yeah. It's an interesting one. It, at the end of the day, you know, for me, this is largely, it looks, it looks from my standpoint, you know, I'm, I'm speaking as an individual, not really on behalf of the company here, but when I watch this and I was there and I see it, it feels like an entire industry is trying to be essentially taken and handed to another, uh, if you want to call it industry, which in Texas, it's one company in the teacup program. And it seems like they're pushing to have an entire multi-billion dollar industry just handed to them. Which from a business standpoint, look, if you're a privately held company, if you're venture capital backed, that's kind of the holy grail. Like, it, I, I can't blame them for making that play. But I also feel like it's fairly obvious what they're trying to do. Well, yeah, I mean, if you're paying attention, it's pretty obvious what they're trying to do. and. If you look, and there are plenty of articles and plenty of papers and all that about how states do not do well by, ha by limiting the number of medical marijuana licensees, by limiting the number of, medical uh, of recreational licenses, it, 
there's no upside to having one company except for that company. Well, what's interesting too, and I told you this, there's twice that two of the senators, Perry being one of them, mentioned this in the prior committee hearings to ours, different topics, uh, but it was mentioned twice that it makes sense to let the market dictate and the market decide what is going to happen. And I think the market has obviously spoken. This has quickly turned into a massive industry within Texas and one of the largest industries in the state. So, so I, don't, I, I don't understand how you can, on one topic, say, we're going to let the market decide, we're going to let, let the people decide. And on the next one, it's like, no, 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 hold on. The market doesn't know what it's doing. The people don't know what they're doing. We're going to keep them safe. We're going to put this in teacup. We're going to take a multi-billion dollar industry and hand it to these guys, and they're going to keep it safe. Take it another step further. Legislators are there to represent the interest of their constituents. The constituents have spoken because if the market hadn't spoken, these products would not be selling the way that they sell. Right. So what the constituents are saying is, yeah, we want this. Yeah, and I mean, the last study that I saw was something around 90% of Texans wanted access to cannabis products. Yeah, not surprising. Um, I mean, that woman from the gym, chronic pain. She's 60 something years old and she's like, none of these medications work, prescription medications, I need something else. And not for nothing, but we do get to choose still, right? Like adults get to make their own decisions still. I mean, I'd like to think so. <laughs> this could I'm prove not me totally wrong. sure on that one. <laughs> this could prove me entirely wrong, but I mean. There are many people that would disagree with that statement. <laughs> uh, we will be back for a uh, part two. Part three. And a part three. So there will be more videos. <laughs> I'm looking at both of you. There's going to be more videos. <laughs> the two of you. With they the two of us back. arguing and bantering. So if this is your jam, and you like us kind of picking on some people while they talk trash about our industry, come back for more. We got you. <laughs> Happy hunting. Lucas and Cynthia with Hometown Hero. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful day.